They're back. The U.S. Chess League, that is. Hi, everybody. Steve Farmer here. And the Chess League for 2013 has already gotten underway. And in this video, we're going to cover the matchup between Arizona and Seattle. For those of you who have watched my videos in the past, you've seen them on Chess Videos TV and on my YouTube channel, as well as blogs I've had. But this year is going to be a little different. Chess.com is hosting the U.S. Chess League, and they are also creating a blog spot for me there. I've already posted an article of this match. So if you're curious as to looking at the games without my commentary here on the video, you can see all my notes over at Chess.com. To watch the Chess League live, you would want to go to uschessleague.com and find the schedule and then you can flip over to chess.com there will actually be a link on the US Chess League page for chess.com and then you can watch them live this is a big benefit from having it on the ICC which they had done in the past you do not need to be a member for chess.com however I highly recommend that you do because I think that chess.com is by far the best chess website out there there's a lot of content a lot of videos there's training programs, uh, you can train tactics, end games, you can train with Chess Mentor. Uh, it's a fabulous site. And Danny Wrench, uh, I've known him for quite a while. He's a top notch guy, and he's done a wonderful job over there. So thanks to Greg and to Danny for coming together on this, and to both of you for letting me post a blog on the chess.com site as well. So we have four games that we're going to look at in this video. On board one, we have Kostin Casiano playing white for Seattle against Mac Molnar playing black. Oh, by the way, congratulations to Mackenzie Molnar and Amanda Mateer. They tied the knot over the summer. Congratulations, guys. May you have many wonderful and prosperous years ahead of you. On board two, we will see Lev Altunian playing Sang for Seattle and then on board three we'll have Kurt Collier playing white against Pedro Matufi and then on board four we have a new player for Arizona a person I've known for a long time Ben Marmont will be playing white against Megan Lee alright let's not waste any more time let's get on with the games you know I'm not one of those people that will bore you to death with statistics and every year that the chess league comes up, there's people like to point out who did what last year and the years before. That doesn't matter because every time they come up with a team, they're getting new members in there. And the lineups are always different. It's not the same people time after time. However, Arizona is very fortunate to be returning several veteran players to the U.S. Chess League. Very strong players. We're going to see two of them here. And if you're going by statistics, in this match, Arizona is heavily favored on the rating. The only close pairing we have is going to be this first game between Costin Cosiano versus Mac Molnar. Costin is rated 24.78 and Mac is 25.12. Mac, I believe, is a GM elect. Uh, right now he's an IM. I think he's got all his norms. He's got his rating. I think what he needs to do is just get officially put in that spot by FIDE when they have the next meeting. So congratulations on that. Mac, you're just, you're rolling things up. And I, I see things in your play, Mac, that I have not seen in a long time. I'm expecting very good things for your future in chess. So let's get on with the games. On board one, we have Costin starting out with E4 and Mac strays away from his pet Sicilian and plays E5. Knight f3, knight c6, bishop to b5, you have the Roy Lopez, a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castles, and bishop e7. And now, I don't know why, but the commentators on chess.com were not sure about this move, but it's the most popular choice. Uh, bishop takes c6 is played. Now, this is an interesting choice by Cosiano. It's the exchange Roy Lopez, the ugly cousin of Jennifer Lopez. Now, it's a, a good choice in some regards. Some people made a good living using this variation with white. The thing is, is that white is giving up the bishop pair for the better pawn structure. We kind of see that here, but it's a horse of a different color in the way that Mac handles it. D takes c6, and now queen to e1. 
By the way, d3 is much more common, and queen to e2 I think is actually a move worth looking at if you're going to play this style of play. But queen to e1. Now I get the feeling that Cosiano had seen a game recently with this variation in it, and it's inspired him to play it. I have not updated my database in probably about three weeks or so, so I am not aware of any topical game with this. Knight to d7. Interesting choice. Probably the best choice as well. Costin plays b3. Obviously intending to Fianchetto the bishop, Matt Castles, bishop b2, and now an interesting move again. It's kind of interesting that Mac does not play the very typical f6 until the very last moment that he has to. And there is some logic to this. Now, bishop to d6 is a rather bizarre looking move, but it has points behind it in that the e-file is now opened up for either the queen or the rook to come in and defend the e-pawn if needed. Also, if the knight on f3 moves somewhere, the queen can come out. Uh, she may well come out to f6 in some lines here, so it's an interesting idea. Now, white's at a crossroads. Does it go d3 or d4? Well, Costin decided on d3, the stodgy approach, but let's take a step back and just point out what happens on d4. It's not critical, but it's important to know if you're going to be facing this. If you play the Roy Lopez, you may be faced with this, so best be armed. Now, black should take, and there's a couple ways of taking back, either with a bishop or a knight. Let's look at the knight first. And here's where the idea of knight to d7 comes in, because you can play queen to f6, which I think is an interesting move. Now, in the game of Blatney versus Golden, uh, rook to e8 was played, and after knight f5, bishop to e5, knight to c3, knight to c5, rook to d1. Uh, this soon found black in a tough position, and he lost in 28 moves, but I don't think that this very position is that terrible. But I, I'm not happy with it. So, looking at this position here with queen f6 instead, now we can see queen to c3. Now, it's possible that this is the kind of ideas that Kostin was familiar with as he plays something similar in the game. And rook e8, and I feel black has an easy position and may even stand a slight bit better here. So that was on knight takes d4. But let's step back and look at bishop takes d4. And after rook e8, knight bd2, c5, bishop b2, b5, queen e3, and bishop to b7. I think black is doing just fine here as well. And this is from the game Stolwagen versus Spolman from Hilversum, Netherlands, 2007. All right, but all that worry is for nothing because Costin decided to go with the stodgy d3. Mac sures up his pawn with rook e8, knight bd2, and now an interesting move, b5. A very simple plan. A lot of times black plays bishop to b7 and c5 in these types of positions. c5 will lock down on the d pawn. It won't be able to move, so d4 square is under lock and key. And you're getting your bishop on a diagonal that can potentially become open after a move such as f5 or something like that. Now, it's There's not a lot of play for black. It's The idea of the bishop pair for black in the exchange for Lopez is to get through the opening in the, the middle game and hold on to your bishop pair, and hopefully they'll still be around toward the end when you can make use of them. Now, if we step back a bit, c5 is usually the move that we get seen played here. But this allows white to just throw the knight into c4. I think this is a comfortable position for white. And knight f8 was tried in a game by Zhang versus Zhao Zhu in China, 2010. Uh, white won in 85 moves after knight c4, knight g6, king h1, bishop g4. You know, a typical development plan here. Um, black is certainly not worse here, but that knight on c4 is very pretty, and black will have to play b5 to kick it out. So this means that Mac has changed the move order slightly here and played b5 so that he can get into some of those lines without the knight coming to c4. So this is not a new move, but it's a rarely played move, and it's worth some investigation. Queen to e3, knight f8, a4, and queen to e7. Now this is a novelty. 
In the game of Alonso versus Orsini in Buenos Aires 1998, move knight g6 was seen. And after rook f e1, f6, knight f1. Uh, bishop b7 is fine here, but he played bishop to d7, knight to g3, queen to e7, knight f5, bishop takes, pawn takes. And the play seems pretty level to me, though white did go on to win, and fairly short order, move 35 he won. But I think black's okay here. But Mac came up with queen e7, which is actually the best move, according to the computer engine. Okay, I think this is a good spot for us to take a pause from this game, and we will go over and take a look at Lev Altunian's game against Sang. And here we are. Lev is playing white, and there are no moves right now. Lev was late. I'm sure you're surprised to hear that. No, this is even worse. Lev thought the game started an hour later than it actually did. So they called him, and he lives pretty much on the other side of town from where they're playing. So I'm sure he had to hightail it across town, run a, a light or two, <laughs> to make it in time to not lose the game on time. Okay. Well, we could sit here and watch this board for another... How late was he? He had 27 minutes remaining, so he was like an hour late. I guess that there's no time forfeit after an hour, but he was had 27 minutes left when he got to the board. I guess that they knew he was coming was excusable enough and that Sang was nice enough to wait for him to show up. You know, hey, you're going to play an IM and you're getting an hour on the clock over him. Who wouldn't love that? All right, so <laughs> let's flip over to Pedram's game and see what's going on there. Okay, Pedram is playing black, and he's playing Kurt Collier. And Kurt starts out with d4, knight f6, knight c3, c5. I don't like this approach until the bishop's on g5, but okay. d5, g6, e4, d6, bishop g5, bishop g7. And we have pretty much a, a Pierce setup. Uh, f3, castles. Queen d2. Now a6 is a novelty as far as I know, but it's a logical enough move. Uh, you know, rook to e8 had been tried before, but a6 is a fine move, I guess. a4, you know, e6. I would have preferred here to play queen to a5, but e6 was played. Bishop c4, and then e5. Again, I think queen to a5, with the idea of knight g e2, then b5. And we have relatively level play. Pedram doesn't play the openings like I do. He, he doesn't mind closed positions. I absolutely hate closed positions. I like semi-open positions. He played e5, giving us a full check Benoni. Yuck. I've never liked the full Benoni positions. They're too cramped. Knight g e2, and now another strange move in my opinion. He plays queen to e8. I can understand he wants to get out of the pin, but oh well. I mean, if you're going to go into this line, you're going to realize your queen's going to be pinned. In other lines of the King's Indian, queen to e8 when the pawn's on c7 makes some sense in, in certain lines, but here it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's just a cramping move. White castle. Now, I think most people would have spotted at this point that a5 was just absolutely locking down on black's position. I think that you'd have to say that white has a clear advantage at this point. But okay, he castled, knight f d7, knight to g3, h5, bishop to d3, king to h7, queen to e2, and now he plays b6. Now he's worried about a5, but I would be more worried about that bishop on g5, and I think the bishop to h6, trying to get it traded off, is the way to go. I think that black is just slightly worse after playing this. After b6, rook a e1, rook to a7, hmm, we'll see something similar in the next game. Bishop to d2, queen to e7, knight to d1, 
knight f6. Again, I think he could have played something like h4, knight h1, and then bishop h6. Aiming to trade off that bishop again. It is white's best bishop and it's black's worst. So trading that bishop is not a big deal for black. It is a big deal for white. I think this is the way to go. Again, I think here black is just slightly inferior. He played knight f6. And then back comes the bishop. And back goes the queen. Here, though, it didn't make sense to retreat the queen again. I thought queen e8 was not a good move in the beginning. And to do it again is doubly bad in my mind. He could have played bishop h6. Of course, white could now retort with f4. But again, I think that black is only slightly inferior in this position. But after queen to e8 and b3, knight to g8, knight to b2, and now he finally plays bishop h6. White should probably play queen to d2 and accept the recapture on g5, but he played bishop takes h6, knight takes, and now queen to d2. And we're at move 22, and this is about on par across the boards about where the players were at all at the same time. So I'm trying to keep you at the same speed move depth-wise on all the boards as we progress. So now we'll flip over to Ben's board and see how he's doing against Megan Lee. Hope he doesn't get beat by a girl. And all you female players out there, please don't send me cards and letters or emails or, or nasty posts. I have much respect for your play, okay? It's just, I'm teasing Ben. All right, Ben is playing white. Megan is playing black. Uh, Megan's rated 2127, Ben's 2157. Now, I said that there was a great disparity on the boards. Well, on the last two boards we saw, yeah, Arizona definitely had uh, a big rating advantage. Here it doesn't seem like it, but I know Ben is a stronger player than the 2157. I know he made master recently, so I don't know why he's at 2157. You can find out more about the ratings that are used at the U.S. Chess League site. So Ben starts out with knight to f3. A very dangerous move. D5, C4, C6, B3, already. Knight F6, Bishop to B2, Bishop to F5, G3, the double fianchetto thingy. E6, Bishop G2, Knight BD7, castles, Bishop E7. Megan's got a decent game here, and Ben's got a decent game. No one's really pushing for any huge advantage at this point. There's no strategical plus or minus for either side at this stage of the game. h6, knight bd2, o dash o, a3, a5. Ready for it, folks? Ready? Rook a2. Oh, we saw Pedram do this in his game, rook a7. So I think it was a plan on everybody on all boards to play their rook to the second square. Okay, folks, I just I beg your forgiveness for a moment here. I just got a text from Greg Shahad, the commissioner of the Chess League, and he's looking for a statistician for the Chess League. And he goes on in his text to explain that uh, he needs somebody that's very math-oriented, but happy to make predictions, and would figure out the following numbers each week. The chance for each team to make the playoffs, Chance for each team to win their division. Guess for each team to win the league championship. Some kind of power ranking that combines both league record and your feeling on the team's strength to rank all league teams in order from 1st to 16th. And lastly, the percentage of win chances for each week's matches, even going so far as to create a Vegas line. So if you have mad math skills, get a hold of Greg. Andy, if you watch this, I'd get a hold of him, see if you can help out with that. So I know that's right up your alley. And Greg goes on to say, and any other cool stats they'd want to come up with. If you have experience with this kind of stuff, are good with math, numbers, statistics, and are a big fan of the league, let us know if you would volunteer to do this, and we would love to have you on board with the team. Thanks, Greg. All right, so you got the commish there, one of our 
most notorious posters here on Chess Videos TV and I guess on Chess.com he's posting videos there as well. So the world is opening up folks. If you have math skills, get a hold of Greg. You can get a hold of him through the uschessleague.com. Okay, now back to the game. Megan flicks in the move c5. Now rook a2 is not a novelty. It's actually been played a few times. There are a couple of ideas to this. One is to bring the queen over to a1 and barrel down the a file. Some lines the queen will go to c2 and the f rook to a1. And then sometimes the bishop will drop back and the rook will come to c2 or d2 and maybe even e2. So there are some functional ideas to the rook being on a2. I think it's redonkulous, but there are ideas behind it. <laughs> and now Ben played c takes d5. And this move is a novelty. In the game between Sergeyev versus Lovak in 1993, rook e1 was played. And for bishop h7, e4, d e4, d e4, a4, uh, play is pretty level, but white went on to win by move 41. And going back here, Queen A1 was tried in the game between Schaefer versus Hoffman, Wiesbaden, 1988. And this is what I was telling you, sometimes the Queen goes to A1. And after Bishop H7, a pretty typical move in this opening, Fianchetto the Bishop on H7. CD5, ED5, D4, D6, Knight E5, Knight takes, Pawn takes, Knight E8, and E4 with pretty level play. This actually looks like a, a very interesting line of play for both sides, actually. This is probably more along the lines of what I would play. Going back to the game, Ben played CD5, ED5, and now D4. I kind of thought he would go in for E4 here. I haven't looked at this very deeply. Uh, it just looks like a worthy idea, E4. But Ben played D4, and now Queen to B6, DC5. Bishop takes c5, e3, rook fc8, knight d4. Uh, it was also possible to reroute the other knight to c3 via b1. But okay, knight to d4, bishop h7, knight 2 to f3, bishop to d6, and now bishop h3. Now when I present videos, I try to give three factors in every game. The opening phase, up until a novelty is played, and the basic concepts of that opening, and then when the novelty is played, to show what had existed before, so that you know why a person is deviating and what their ideas are in, in the new line that they're trying to come up with. The second thing I like to do is to explain the middle game concepts and that we'll do here in a moment. And then the third thing I do in the videos is when we get into tactical melees, I like to point out some of the variations. Uh, some are just plain cute, and some are just essential knowledge that you have to have. Now this move, Bishop H3, struck a few people on the chat room as being a strange move. Why do this? Well, I thought Bishop H3 was a good move. I played a move like this myself in my own games probably three or four times when I Actually, it was always when I played a queen pawn opening, which uh, I don't do that often. So the, uh, the move bishop h3 is not really all that rare. It, it tacitly controls the c8 square. So that knight on d7 can't move while a rook is there or when a rook wants to get there. That knight has to be there to block the bishop out. That's one. Two, it pins the knight. And three, it is actually a redeployment idea. And that's how I used it in the past in my games, was as a redeployment of this bishop from the g2 diagonal down to the b1, h7 diagonal. The idea is the best piece that black has here really is the bishop on h7. It cuts across white's camp. Now that won't remain the best piece later in the game, but more on that later. All right, I think it's a good time here to flip over to Max board, see how he's faring there. Okay, back in this game, Mac had just played Queen of E7. 
Now, f6 is a viable move, and we had already looked at the move knight to g6, which was from the game Alonzo versus Orsini. The max move is queen to e7, rook f e1, bishop d7. Now, the point behind this, instead of going to b7, is Mac doesn't feel that the h1 a8 diagonal will open up anytime soon because he's opted for a different move order on the queenside pawns. If c5 had been played, he more likely would have gone to b7. Knight f1 was played, and now I thought c5 should be played, but Mac plays knight to g6. Let's just put c5 on the board. And the thing here is uh, I think black is doing just fine in either regards, but Mac is definitely not one to go with the typical plans of any other player. That's what makes him such a good player. Knight to g6. Knight to g3. At this point, I felt that the position was dead level. And again, I thought c5 would keep it level. Again, Mac doesn't agree with me. And boy, am I not surprised. He's a good player. Actually, Houdini likes c5 as well. But Mac plays bishop c5. And I mark this as an interesting move. If you were to go by Houdini's evaluation, you probably would give it a dubious move mark. But on a, a purely team situation understanding of how games are played in the chess league, I think this is a good move. What I mean by that is you don't just play on your own board. You're also looking at your teammates' boards to see how they're faring. And by the time this position rose up, now Mack had slowed down quite a bit here because Lev hadn't showed up and he wanted to see how things were progressing on the other boards. And it was around this point that Pedram was getting in a really, really tight position. He may have already lost a pawn in that game. I, I'm not sure. It was right around this point, I know, that Pedram had gone down a pawn. It wasn't devastating. Uh, he had some compensation for it, but he was down a pawn in a cramped position. So Mack is trying to figure a way to be more forceful in how he handles this game. Not an easy task in the exchange Roy Lopez. Not easy at all. C5 technically is the better move, but Bishop C5 is tempting White to open up the position. And what do you want to do when you have the bishop pair? Obviously, you want to open up the position. So that's Max idea here, basically. And Costin's pretty much forced to play D4 here. You know, otherwise he's just going to allow himself to get pushed back and say, okay, Mac, you're much better than me. I'm going to just cave. Now, I think that E takes D4 leads to a roughly level position, but again, Mac played Bishop to B6, the road less traveled. Let's take a look at takes. All right, then Bishop takes, Bishop to D6, E5, Bishop to B4, and c3. Now the problem with this for black is it would end up forcing the trade of a pair of bishops. Mac doesn't want to trade him in this manner. If he's going to trade him it's going to be on his own terms. So after d4 he played bishop to b6 and now queen to c3. And I made mention of this move before that maybe Austin had seen something like this and it inspired him to play this way. Now queen to c3 though to be honest with you is not the best move. And the practical point of Max play is that maybe he knew of this game as well and realized that Costin may not have known anything different than, than this plan, this setup. I know that's reading in too much into both players' play, but it's possible. In reality, though, knight f5 was a move to play here. And I think that white seizes the initiative after this. For example, if bishop takes f5, e f5, knight to h4 to get that pawn back, or trade, a5, bishop a7, knight takes e5, knight takes f5, knight takes c6, knight takes e3, knight takes e7 is check, rook takes, rook takes, rook takes, pawn takes. White is a pawn up. He's got a fugly bishop for sure, but it's a pawn. A pawn is a pawn is a pawn. And I would much rather have white here. I think white is in a very good position. A definite clear advantage. Not a winning advantage, but definitely a clear advantage for white. So after knight f5, black would have to go passive. 
with queen to f8. And now after a5, bishop a7, queen to g5. I think that the position's roughly level here, but really, come on, white is the only one having fun with this. So yeah, I think that knight f5 was a more enterprising way to handle the position. Costin played queen to c3, and now we get a little bit of trading going on. E d4, knight takes d4. And I, I thought that b4 was the mood to play. It was not. He played queen to e5. Just a quick look at my idea of b4. And if queen to e3, now a5. And I think this is good for equality. But maybe Mac thought this is a little bit too devoid of play. And that's why he went queen to e5. Okay. Tension starting to mount here. And play is not clear at all. This would be a good point to pause and go over the Lev's game and see what's happening there. Do, 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 Yeah, Lev hasn't made it back yet. All right. Let's go to the next game. Okay. Pedram is playing black against Kurt Collier. And I don't know what's happened here. I may be repeating a move or two. I'm, I apologize if that's the case, but I had position markers and they disappeared on me for some reason. All right. I believe that we left off here where knight takes h6 was played. The trade of bishops just happened on h6. And, and Collier plays queen to d2. Now knight to d7, h3, queen to e7. How many times is this queen going to move in the opening? Knight c4, h4. Knight h1. Uh, black should now play knight f6. He plays g5, which is a weakening move. Let's look at knight f6 to see what comes out of this. Then f4 is the obvious try. b5, counter shot. f e5, d e5, a b5, a b5, and now d6 is a move. If white plays knight to e3, I think this is just equal. So in order to go for any kind of advantage, I think white has to try d6. And now after queen to e6, he's going to get a good game after queen to g5, threatens the knight, king to g7, knight takes e5, and white is doing very well here. But this gives black some play at least in the game after g5, and that's also based on white seeing from here the move d6. Now, I mean, it's not complicated, but it's not obvious either from this position. After knight h1, g5 is played. Again, knight f6 is worth looking at. Uh, knight f2, rook to b7. I mean, these moves are really rough for black. He is so bottled up. Knight g4, rook to g8. Uh, I think he should have taken on g4 right away. Knight c3. And again, I think he should take on g4. He plays knight to b8. Let's look at it real quick. Knight takes g4. Now it's best to take with the f-pawn. If knight takes g4, then rook to b8. And white has a small edge. Nothing more. So f takes g4 is the best way to play to get lines open. Rook a7, knight f5. And I think that white is clearly better here. But he's also clearly better after the move that Pedram played, knight to b8, queen to e2, rook to a7, knight to c4. Now bishop takes g4, it looks a little more promising than knight to d7, which was played in the game. A uh, real quick look at it. Bishop takes g4. Now if h takes g4, knight to d7, black is only slightly worse here. And after f takes g4, b5, and knight to d2, I, th I think that white is clearly better, but not winning. After knight c4 in the game, knight to d7 was played by Pedram. Knight to g3. Okay, and here Pedram plays b5. Rook a8 is the best move. b5 actually loses a pawn. Can you see how? Okay, it's pretty easy. Knight to a5, it's threatening the fork on c6. He's got to deal with it, and now, bump, bump, bump. And now, sadly, at this point, I could really only wait 
for Pedram's resignation. He's got a cramp position and he's pawned down. Surely Kurt's going to be able to figure this out. He's got a rating of 2266. He's a pawn up and he's playing a guy that's only 150 points higher rated. So he should be able to push this through to make a win. Let's continue on for a few more moves here. Knight f6, knight c6 penetrating, nice post for the knight, queen f8, and now knight g4, which is a mistake. All right, this is a good place to stop. We'll come back to this and we'll explain why knight to g4 is not the best move. Okay, when we last looked at this game, I was explaining the merits of Ben's last move, bishop to h3. Kind of an odd looking move. Now, Megan thought, you know, probably best to get off that file. I think that maybe rook c7 was worthy of being played, but she just played rook to e8. Ben now plays knight h4. Threatens to come in f5 with tempo, so Megan just drops the bishop back right away. And now a4. Knight to c5, and now bishop f5. And I think in reality, Megan should probably just fess up and, and say that you know what, uh, that bishop that he just brought into the game is the same value as mine and it's probably best to just get rid of it so I'm not cramped on the king side. But she didn't do that. She played g6. Let's take a quick look at bishop takes f5 though, just so you can see what I'm talking about. Knight takes, queen e6, bishop takes on f6, queen takes, and then knight's d4. And it's just dead level position where white's got the opportunity to play against the isolated queen pawn. So there's something for white to do. You know, black doesn't seem to have too many worries on defending it. It looks equal to me. But Megan played g6, so we are now in the battle of two poorly placed pieces. Who do you have your money on? The rook on a2 or the bishop on h7? Take your pick and remember this line because it's never going to be played again. All right, bishop b1 was played, so we see this full Redeployment of the king's bishop to the b1 square. Very interesting. I've done that before too. I think it's a lot of fun. You can you can change the whole flavor of a game by doing something like this. All right. So rook a c8, and the battle plan is pretty clear. White would like to do something to win the d pawn, but he's not in a big hurry. And now you may think that taking the bishop off of that diagonal that was pressurizing the d-pawn is not the right idea. I don't know. That's open for debate. Uh, I like Ben's plan. If Megan makes a misstep on the king side, it's all over. White's got everything pointed in that direction. So, all right. Ben played knight to b5. Rook e d8. Well, obviously there's the threat against taking on f6 and then d5. So rook e d8, knight f3. Knight a6, queen d4, Ben offers an exchange of queens, which really cannot be turned down. And now the bishop's on a nice post. Knight to d7, bishop c3, bishop b4, he trades the bishops, rook to d2. Uh, so we see that rook on a2 finally come into game, the bishop on h7 still stuck there. Knight to c5, knight f to d4. Knight to e4. Okay, black's got equal play now. Uh, it's totally equal. Uh, rook d to d1. Knight to c3. Knight takes. Rook takes. Rook to c1. Rook d to c8. Rook takes c3. Rook takes c3. Rook to d1. And now g5 is a very good move. This move frees the bishop. And it also blocks white from playing f4 or h4 in any convenient manner. All right, so let's pause here, and then we'll go back to Mackenzie Molnar versus Casiano. Okay, in this game, Mac just played queen to e5, and Costin plays knight df5, queen takes queen, bishop takes queen, and now f6, and knight to h5. And now Mac takes the opportunity here to lop off the knight for his bishop. He gives up his bishop pair, but the pressure on g7 demands that he take drastic action like this. So, not what you want to do, but what you have to do. And now knight to e7. 
Now I'll let you look at this for a moment before we go on to the next game. But Mac is actually coaxing his opponent into a little combination here. It's not a bad combination. It's not a good combination, but it's one that will tempt black into doing a material imbalance. So, Costin has to spend some time on this, a good deal of time, to determine fully if it is a good way to go. I mean, you can look at it, and I'll, I'll give you the hint right now, it's bishop takes f6. And the thing is, after the sack happens, do you take it? Allow the fork and king to f7, which is going to get into a, a very strange material imbalance. Do you do it? All right, we're going to flip over to Lev because I heard he just came in through the door. So let's go take a look. Yay, Lev just came in and played knight f3, a very scary move. And actually this game went kind of quickly in the opening phase. So we're going to catch up to speed here. E6, and this is Tian Sang playing black, and Levon Altunian playing white. G3, D5, Bishop G2, Bishop to D6, O dash O, and now E5. A rare move. It's not bad, but it is moving the same piece twice in the opening, uh, moving the E6, moving the E pawn twice. You know, it can't be good. But Lev is way down on time. He has under 27 minutes here. C4, D takes C4. This is actually a novelty. I'm surprised that the position has been played before at all, given the waste and tempo of the e pawn. But c6 has been played before. And this is Maya Cortez versus Sarriego from Bayamo, 1981. Okay, so it's been a while. d3, just to give you a flavor for the kind of positions you can get out of this. And. You know, we got a fairly level position here. But Tian played d takes c4. And of course, Lev is just going to recoup that pawn. He plays queen a4, knight to d7, knight to a3. He'd like to take with the knight if possible. Knight gf6, and he does take with the knight. And now he's starting to come close to catching up with some of his teammates on the number of moves into the game even though he was about an hour late. Black castles in d4. Now by this he's hoping to lure his opponent to advance a little further. I think it's okay to play knight takes d6, cd6, and d3. I think this is fine for white. We get something that's not too dissimilar from the game continuation. The bishop here for white is a nice luxury to have, the open c file, you know, those kind of things. But in the line that Lev chose, things are a little more cramped on white. But on the flip side, they're a little bit more overextended for black. So, there's two sides to the coin here with the move that he played in the game, d4. Alright, Tian did play e4. And now, I thought that knight f e5 was the move he was going to play, but Lev dropped back. Very interesting. It's very low on time. It's hard to, to explain. When you're watching this game, and all the games going on, and you're watching Lev play these moves, and you're going, oh, this is natural, this is natural, this is what I would do with little time, this is what I'd do with little time, this is what I'd do with little time. And Lev doesn't do any of that. He's calm, cool, collected, and goes about his business. And his business is to upset the apple cart, and he does so very well against saying here. Rook e8 was played, queen to c2. Now knight to b1 to c3 was a good redeployment idea, but queen to c2 is fine, queen to e7. And now he takes on d6, because black has to take with the pawn, can't take with the queen, he plays c takes d6. Uh, well, he just loses the e pawn if he takes with the queen. Presto, voila. So c takes d6 had to be played, now knight to c4, d5, Knight e3. Okay, now black should play knight to b8 to c6, but he plays knight to b6. Bishop to d2. Again, this is part of Lev's style, his quirky style, I would call it. I think most players here would have rather played b3. Limits the knight on b6, 
and gets ready to bring the bishop to b2 or a3 when it's prepared properly. But love just brings the bishop to d2. <laughs> now, maybe he's got ideas of b3 and a3 and bishop to b4. He's got all sorts of ideas in play here. But he's, he's just mainly playing stuff that are moves that are good enough and that will cause the opponent to take some time to think. Because the one commodity Lev lacks in this game is time on the clock. So if he can make his opponent take some time off of his clock, then he can use their time to think about what he wants to do. Okay, now bishop to g4 is probably the best move for black here. Uh, it gives an equal position, but Tian plays knight to g4, and it is so tempting to do something about this knight on e3. But trading a knight for a knight in a fairly close position, it doesn't seem to be what is demanded of the position. I think bishop g4 is a better idea. Okay, now Lev plays another move that one would not expect. He plays queen to c5. It's a logical move, nothing wrong with it. It's just you would think again b3 or rook to c1, things like that. Or maybe trade the knights, you know. But Lev is a master at this stuff. He's down on time and he's making his opponent think, which gives him time to think. All right, we will rejoin this game after we look at the others. All right, we rejoin the Pedro Matufi playing black versus Kurt Collier, and Kurt plays knight to g4. He should just simply play rook to a1. But he's trying to get in an attack for some reason. It's not needed. And now knight to h5, and white is better here. There's no doubt about that because he's a pawn up, but black has a certain amount of compensation for the pawn. Queen to d2, and now f5. This is Pedram's idea to try and bust things open. e takes f5, knight takes f5, bishop to d3, king h8, rook to a1 now. I think taking on f5 looked more logical. Let's take a look at that. Boom, boom. Knight to e3, knight to g3, rook to f2. And white is a pawn up, and black has a little tiny bit of compensation, but not enough. And the goal of trading is when you're up in pawns, trade pieces. It increases the strength of your extra pawn. So he played rook to a1 instead. Knight f to g3, rook f to e1, and now knight to f4. I think that taking the knight on g4 might have been worth a shot. And now play knight to f4. And after bishop c4, white still has an advantage, but black is in the game and fighting. Instead, he played knight f4 right away. Rook to a8. And now queen to g7 would hold the temporarily balance that we have here. But Pedram played knight takes d5. He's so wanting to get that pawn back, but it is not the right move. And after this, his camp starts to implode. Bishop c4. It's a nice move. Pins the knight. Knight to b6. This is Pedram's idea. He was thinking that I'm going to attack his rook, so his attack on my rook doesn't really have that much bearing on things. But after takes and takes, look where black's knight is. Look how exposed Black's king is. Okay, White can't get to it right away. Or can he? Well, let's take a look here. Now he plays bishop to d5. Thinks, I got the goods. I'm going to get out of here. Wrong move. He should have played queen takes g5. Bazinga. Now, I am not surprised at all that Kurt did not go in for this. Maybe he looked at it and just said, you know, too complicated. And indeed, it is complicated on the surface. Why is it complicated? Well, when you're analyzing positions, you have to think deep and you have to think wide. And you try and reach a happy medium between the two. Well, when they're both deep and wide, it ain't easy. So the problem here is that Black has a lot of different moves at his disposal but none of them are good. Uh, if he had been able to take the time and assess each one of these moves properly, he probably would have played this move. Queen takes g5, just it wins. 
but you'd have to have some really big cojones to play this move. All right, so let's look at the obvious first, which is what you always do. Rook takes c6. Well, okay, now we can just play bishop to d5. All right, now there's threats that are starting to crop up here, including things like knight to f6, uh, queen to queen takes h4, and then taking the knight on g3. We're going to see a lot of that in these lines. So let's take a look. Rook to c7. Uh, the knight on a8 is not really a big factor about it hanging. You want to have a defender come in. If you had rook to a6, then a lot of these checks that white is going to start throwing around will not be, uh, you will not be able to parry them. So, now for example, taking the knight is not a big deal for black. Now bishop takes g4, f takes g4, queen takes a8, queen takes h4, king to g7, queen takes g3, c4. Hey, it's not a lovely position for black, but at least he's fighting. He's down two pawns, but he's fighting. No, not bishop takes a8. Queen takes h4 is the way to go. And now rook h7, the idea behind rook to c7, queen takes g3. And white is up two pawns. Um, black's pieces look retarded. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to say developmentally challenged. All right, so rook takes c6 is not the answer to queen takes g5. What about queen takes g8? Well, boom. And now we check here. Because if the queen takes this, we go here. And now we got a piece hanging on c7. And white's got three pawns for the piece and the bare naked king to go after. Bishop takes. Pawn takes queen to e8, trying to protect all these pawns. Knight takes e5, four pawns for the piece. And this is just a crushing line for white. So going back to queen takes g5, how about bishop takes g4? Well, h takes g4, work to g7, queen takes h4, king takes g8, queen takes g3. Again, two pawns up, very nice advantage for white. He's winning. Last thing you have to look at after queen takes g5 is what about knight to f5? Trying to bring a defender back. This is where it gets a little tricky. First, you want to preserve your bishop with bishop to c4. And again, we come to yet another crossroads. You have to analyze a couple branches. And again, we'll take a look at taking on c6 first, because you always want to look at checks, captures, and force moves first. And now what do you do? This is a very hard move to spot, so I don't blame you if you miss this one. It's simply a rook lift. Rook to e4. Now you're threatening to bring a knight somewhere, and then your rook to either g4 or take on h4, whatever the position calls for. So, for example, if d5 here, we go bishop takes d5, rook to a6. This is just mainly to design a lateral defense on the third rank for black. And knight takes e5, getting three pawns for the piece. I don't see a way for black to survive this. And, you know, a move like rook to g4 coming in is going to be pretty hard to beat. Knight to c7 is the other possibility. Now queen checks on h5, and now knight takes d5 on pawn takes knight then rook to g4 is just going to win the game real quick either way so this is to block the bishop or g4 king f6 f4 and now if d takes c4 we have rook to g6 king e7 and knight takes c6 check can you say crushed good i knew you could or knight to e6 here. Then we have rook to g6 check. And again, taking on c6. And knight a7. This is just embarrassing for black. So that's on rook to c6. There's also rook to g7 trying to be all defending and all seeing. But now we get this. Rook to d1. Queen to g7. And now we just go up in material two pawns. Up for white, he's winning. 
Now, very hard to see from back here all of what we just went through. And playing in the time control that these fellows have to play in is very rough. As a matter of fact, playing a combination like that in almost any modern tournament is going to be rare to see. So you're going to find them with your computer later on, but you're not going to see them at the board. And I think that is a big loss for chess. You know, everybody's going to these faster time controls. I can understand it for something like the U.S. Chess League. You have a team on the West Coast that's facing a team on the East Coast. You know, we have a big time difference between the two. So you've got to whittle down how much time is going to be played in the game so the guys in the East Coast can get to bed at a decent hour, i.e. 1 o'clock in the morning. So I can understand it for this. But when you have a gathering of a bunch of people in a tournament hall for a weekend or a week or two weeks, to have a short time control does not make sense. And when we go that route, we go a, a game in 90 all across the board. I'll stop covering chess. All right, so Kurt didn't play that. He played bishop to d5. And after knight to b6, he followed it up with another blunder. He could still play queen takes g5 here, but he plays knight to a5. I don't know why. And now I thought Pedram was going to play queen to f4, which I think gives him a chance to, to take a slight edge. Instead, he played knight takes d5. But let's look at queen to f4. Knight to e3. Doesn't want to trade queens. Queen to d4. Really not much choice for white here. Plays knight a c4. Knight takes c4. Queen takes d4. C takes d4. Knight takes c4. Rook to c5. Bishop f7. It's really the only place for it to go without getting traded. And bishop a6. And I think black should be able to hold the draw. Uh, he actually may stand a little bit better here. He's got quite a dynamic position. So queen f4 was an interesting try. But Pedram plays knight takes d5. And after queen takes d5, bishop takes g4, h takes g4. I think the game is just dead level now. I think Pedram would, should have no problem holding this game. All right, this is a good spot to stop watching this game right now and we'll flip over to see how Ben is doing on board four. Okay, we rejoin this game where Megan had just played g5 and Ben trades off the bishops and king f1. Alright, the writing is on the wall. This one is going to be a draw by default. Uh, default of both players. Uh, king to g6, king to e2, f5, king to d2, rook to d3 check, king to e2. Rook to c3, king to d2. Rook to d3 check, king to e2. Rook to c3, king to d2. And if she does it one more time, it's a draw. But she doesn't play for the threefold repetition. She goes rook to c8. And then, strange thing happened. This position remained live on the server until Ben's clock ticked all the way down. And we thought Ben had lost the game on time. Everybody was like up in arms in the chat room. They go, what happened in Marmont's game? Did he lose on time? Really? No, it turned out that she did play rook to c8, but a draw offer was made by one or the other, and they decided to have peace terms right now and call it a draw. The only problem is they didn't take it off the live viewer which they usually do when a game is over, they are pretty quick to take it down. But this one just kept there with the uh, clock ticking down for Ben and had us worried. Okay, so we have our first result of the match uh, on board four. It is a draw. Let's get over to board one and see what's shaking there. All right, back to Max's game against Costin Cosiano. Our hero, when we last saw him, Played to move knight to e7 to try and provoke Costin to play the sacrifice. And Costin obliged. Played bishop takes f6. And then, what do you do here? You do what Mac does. You just turn down the combination completely. You know, and that's frustrating for a player to spend a lot of time trying to figure out a combination, and then you just simply ignore it. 
All right, but let's take a look here at what had to be calculated, and it's not that evil for black. You know, so, okay, you take with the pawn, and he takes, and he forks you, and then you go here, and then he gets this. So he's got, um, he gave up two pieces and, uh, for a rook and a pawn. Now, rook a d1, knight takes f5, so we get a pawn back out of this. Rook d7 is checked. Good block. I'll trade. And, you know, it's up to you. You know, if you like playing with the miners, I think black is fine. If you like playing with the rook, I think white is fine. So, you know, Mac probably was just enjoying this guy calculating all this out. And he's like, you know what? I don't want to play this particular variation. Although it is absolutely safe for him. <laughs> so that, that had to come as a shock with knight takes f5. All right. Now, g4 actually might be the best shot for white here. He plays bishop b2. And I think this is where he starts to come unraveled a bit. Um, if he plays g4, then king f7, pawn takes, pawn takes. Uh, this just looks dead level. But it gives some open files for white to play on. But black has a pretty nice bishop sitting there on b6. So it's equal. Instead, Constantine plays bishop b2. I mean, it's not bad. He's not unraveling like he's going full tilt. It's just whatever he wanted from that little combination was not there. And now knight to d4. And now here is a strange part of the game. Uh, King f1 makes a lot of sense, and that is what it was played here. But one of the observers made the comment that Houdini liked the move king to f1, which was played. And then when he played it, when it came on the board, this guy said, ah, he played my move. Well, dear viewer and fellow chatter at chess.com, he didn't play your move. He played the move that you said Houdini would play. And that's because he's a strong player. So if I may interject a bit of friendly advice, please don't use computer analysis when talking about things in the chat room. Actually, don't even use the computer analysis when watching the games. Take your time and try and figure out what's going on on your own. Don't use a computer to do that. Use your own brain power to do that. That is how you will improve. As a matter of fact, when the U.S. Chess League was hosted on the ICC, the Internet Chess Club, it was a rule not to have any computer analysis in the chat room. And the reason being is that a lot of the people that follow these games treat them as kind of like a solitaire puzzle. They can play along with the players and see what they would move if it was their turn. And when you throw a computer analysis out there, it ruins it for everybody. Well, not just that you're giving the move away, but if there's like a, a, a blunder that happens that none of the players notice and you don't see it, you get the chance after the game to go back through it with your engine and see where you missed it. And those are things that you want to have paid particular attention to. So if you put your sweat and your, your thought power into it and you miss something, you want to find it because you'll learn the lesson. You'll find it later when you're doing your own post-mortem on the game. But to have it just claimed out on the, the chat room, then the game is marred, and for the rest of the game, you're going to go, oh, you know, this is sad, he missed that. Okay, now, other people making uh, claims on their own, saying, I would play this here, I'd play that, that's fine, that's well and good. Because most players are thinking along the same lines. And, you know, the analysis by the, the chat room observers can go on and on, you know, several moves deep, which is a lot of fun because you're then comparing notes with other people. And other people will correct you or they'll go, oh, no, that's a great idea. So you get praise where you deserve praise and you get helpful advice when you're going slightly astray. So don't post computer analysis on the chat rooms. Thanks. All right. Now, Mac played rook to f8. I thought knight takes c2 should have been played, but he played rook to f8. Let's take a look at knight takes c2, and we're going to see why this guy chose to move king to f1. Now, say knight takes c2. Rook takes e8, rook takes e8, now rook to c1. And after knight to b4, white's going to get one of the pawns back, at least, with bishop to g7. And then knight to d3. Uh, uh, this is unclear, but black's got a good amount of play here. I actually would prefer to be black. Centralized pieces, equal material, 
and all the pieces are active, but they're active for both sides. So you'd have to say it's equal, but it comes down to a matter of preference. I like black. Now, let's go back to rook c1 here. Now, if white's king were still on g1, then there would be no pawns threatened, and black could play uh, simply g6 here, save all his pawns, because there would be a mate threat on e1 if the rook took on c2. So that was the idea behind king f1. It's not because Houdini said it's good, it's because it had logic in the game. All right, rook f8 was played by Mac. Rook to e7. Rook takes f2. Ah, oh, this is beautiful. King takes. Knight to f5 is discovered. Check. King to f3. Knight takes e7. Now bishop takes g7. And Mac plays knight to f5. Okay, now. A lot of times you want to look at the games that you're reviewing, your own games and other people's, and you want to go with, okay, I like this idea, and he played this, so what is the end comparison of the two? Which do I like better? Now, my particular flavoring would be going for the line that we just looked at, where the final position was this. Black seemed very active, a bit more active than white, but you know, in reality it's about the same. I like black here. This is the line that Mac chose. And white seems a little more active here. The black has gotten a pawn out of this deal. So, my line, Max line. My line, can we win a pawn? Yeah, probably. We will be able to win another pawn. Max line, he's already won it, but there's some bit of uh, compromising and allowing white a little more active position. Very interesting call that you need to make, you know? All right, so bishop e5 was played here. King f7, rook to d1, rook to e8. And I think that white should probably check on d7 here, but he played king to f4 right away. And now knight to d6. And I'll tell you what, I think this is probably a good place to pause this, and we'll jump over to the Valtinian's game, see what's happening over there. All right, in the game Altunian versus Tseng, we just saw Love play the queen up to c5, offering the trade. And now Tseng takes on e3, but what happens with the queen trade? Well, now we take and we're hitting the knight, but he can flick in this move because it hits the rook too, so bishop takes e3, knight to c4. Bishop d4, bishop f5. Um, though this position is pretty much, technically speaking, level, I still like white's position because of the bishop pair. I think white has a slight advantage here, but give it a few more moves and black can make a couple more weaknesses and white will have a clear advantage. But Sang played knight takes e3, bishop takes e3, bishop g4. All right, putting pressure on the e2 pawn, so something has to be done. Rook f e1. f3 was playable, but I think Lev didn't want to let his opponent have any play whatsoever. Rook a c8. Now, if black were a dog playing the game of chess in this position, he would say, that c file is mine. It's mine. It's mine. All those squares on the c file, they're mine. Queen takes queen. Rook takes h3, bishop f5, g4, just getting the bishop back. Bishop f4, making doubling hard, not impossible. But this little nuance gives Lev time to level out things and make the control of the c file a moot point. Rook to c2, b3, rook to e8. Now rook e to c1, beautiful move. Lev smacks on the right plan here. He's, he's just going to bring his king over to d1. Very simple. And now rook e to c8. Notice here that if he tries taking the pawn, that's a bad doggy. Rook to c7, rook to c8, rook takes b7, rook c to c2. All right, now bishop to e3. 
Now, oddly, thanks to some nice, interesting tactics in this position, the pigs on the seventh don't mean a damn thing for black. He can try and win the A-pawn. That seems like the most he can do right now. So let's take a look at that. Rook takes, rook takes. And now what do you do? Well, there's a cute little move here. Bishop takes E4. D, E4. And now D5. And the point here is if either the bishop or the knight takes on D5, it's going to be checkmate. You know, bishop D5. Boom, boom, boom. And if knight takes, same thing. So bishop c8 has to be played here. Uh, if he played the d7, then we play bishop takes b6 and rook takes d7. So bishop c8, rook to b8. And we're threatening bishop takes b6 and rook takes c8. Uh, White's going to regain the piece with a, a more active position here. And a pawn on d5. Uh, it's looking actually kind of dangerous for black. Now, black probably can save the game, but it's very dangerous. So after rook e c1, he decided not to take on e2, and he plays rook e to c8. How can you go wrong having domination on the only open file? Well, here's how. King f1, and the king is just going to slide on over to d1. He plays f5, g5. Love doesn't want to make this trade, at least not right now. Bishop f7, king e1, and king f8. He should have played bishop to h5 here, putting pressure on that e-pawn, and now bishop f1 a6, king d1, and yeah, even here I like white's position. This is a little bit better for black than what happens in the game. But here, uh, black plays king to f8, and this is just flat out a mistake. Can you see why this is a mistake? Okay, well Lev missed it. He played king to d1, which was in accordance to his plan, and it's good enough. But he could have played bishop to d6. This is a check. King comes over, and then rook takes rook. Rook takes rook. And now bishop c5 cuts off the escape squares for that rook on c2. For example, if knight to d7, this is probably the best shot. King to d1. And now if rook to b2, then bishop a3 is just going to win the rook. So rook takes c5. Pawn takes knight takes and rook to c1. And White has given up a piece and a pawn for the rook. He's got open file for his rook. He's got his bishop's not exactly the most beautiful piece on the board, but simply e3 and bishop to f1 reroutes it to more active places. I think that White is on the verge of winning in this position. Now, after king to d1, and rook takes, rook takes, rook takes, king takes, things are pretty level, but White does have the bishop here, and that's enough to give Lev some promise to play for two results. And he continues on. King to e7, bishop e5, g6, f4, bishop e8, a4. All right, around this point, my second corona had been drained and I had to trot off to the kitchen to get another beer. And when I came back, this position was on the board. All right, so I had to run back and see what the hell happened. And I had to look and make sure I had the right names on the board. What had happened is he made a sacrifice. Knight takes a4, and it's just a blunder. Knight to c8 just leaves a slightly, slightly inferior position for black. I mean, it's it's negligible. He should be able to draw with knight to c8. Why play knight takes a4? Did he seriously think he's going to be able to promote one of those two pawns on the queen side? Well, come on. That's ridiculous. Uh, White's going to easily stop that from happening. His king's over there. He's got an extra bishop. He's got a lot dark squared bishop. It's going to just absolutely tie everything up. It's just this uh, crazy idea. Then I thought, oh, well, maybe it's a defensive idea that after e3 and bishop b5, as he played in the game, he's going to take advantage of the fact that White can't really run his king over to e1 without worrying about those pawns promoting. And he has to put his king on e1 in order to get the bishop on g2 back into the game. Otherwise, with black's bishop controlling the a6 to f1 diagonal, 
he's going to be playing like he's two pawns down rather than a piece up. Interesting. So this is very problematic for Lev to figure out, and it's very instructive. So we'll come back to this, because this is a big turning point in this match. All right, so now we're going to go over to Pedram's game and see how he's doing. Okay, it's Pedram, black, to move. And I thought he should play rook to d7 here. He did not. He played rook to h7, which is not a good move at all. And we'll see why in a moment. But let's take a look at rook to d7. What's the idea here? Well, first of all, if he tries rook takes e5, which looks like the antidote to this line, then d takes e5, and if queen takes d7, then black can play e4. I think that Kurt probably would have played this line if Pedram had played rook to d7. I mean, it's a natural looking line, but this is big trouble for white. Okay, if black's king were not so exposed, I'd say that this is winning for black. But, you know, once black tries to infiltrate with the queen to attack the white king, then white's going to have a whole mess of checks. Uh, so I think that white can probably end up drawing this, but boy, the initiative is solidly with black in this position. So that's after rook to d7, rook takes e5. That looks like the natural move, doesn't it? So what Kurt would have to find would be queen to c6. And I think that he maintains a slight edge after this, but, you know, come on. This is what you have to play for when you play a, a crappy opening like uh, check Benoni. Queen to f7, protecting the rook. Knight to c4. King to g7. Knight takes d6. Queen to e6, knight f5 check, king f6, now queen takes c5, knight f5, g f5, and it's a sizable advantage for white, he's up two pawns right now, but it's, it's not a trivial win either. So even the best line for white is going to be hard to win. Instead, Pedram played rook to h7, and now knight to c4. And I think he should play queen to f4 here. He did not. Uh, queen to f4. Let's look at that. If queen takes d6, queen to d4 check. Queen to h2, queen takes queen, knight takes rook to d7, and knight to e4. Uh, white should win this pretty easily, but it's not trivial either. After rook to h6, though, rook to a1. And all of a sudden, more threats are coming in. Look, rook to a8 is the immediate threat. Knight to e2 check, king f2, knight f4 hitting the queen. And now queen to a8 is a mistake. That's what was played in the game. He should have played queen to b7. All right, the, queen, the white queen is safe and still threatening rook to a8. So queen to g7, rook checks, king up, queen to e4 with check, rook to g6, and now knight takes d6. White is up a healthy pawn, dominates the board, and is still attacking. Yeah, I, I'd hate to be black in this position. Anyway, he did not play queen to b7, he played queen to a8, and Pedram took the chance to trade off real quick, which eases his defensive task somewhat, and now Pedram plays king to g7, which is a slight inaccuracy. King to h7 was a little bit better, and then after these moves, I think that black can hold the draw here. So I was feeling pretty good about things here, especially since Lev's opponent went full tilt and sacked the bishop. I, I felt confident that Lev would be able to win that. But the Mackenzie Molnar versus Cosiano game was looking like it's going to end up being a draw. If anything, I thought Mac was a little better there. And then uh, Ben's game, we already know that, that was a draw. So if Pedram could hold a draw here and Mac gets a draw on one, then Lev will win on two and it'll be a win for Arizona. Instead, Pedram plays King to G7. And now knight to e3, rook to e6, knight f5 check, 
and king f7. Okay, we'll come back to this position after we look at Max game and Lev's game. Okay, Koziano is on a move here and he plays knight to g3. Now Max throws out another sharp move, bishop to e3. I didn't even see that. I didn't even consider this move. Okay, they were playing rather quickly, but uh, still, that's no excuse. This is a good move. I liked it. Once I saw it, I go, oh yeah! Uh, king takes, rook takes. Uh, now we have rook and knight versus rook and knight. Uh, very drawish. Uh, Mac has some chances, you know, but he's got to be careful too because white has some chances. King to d2. Pawn takes on a4. Rook to f1 check. King to e6. And pawn takes on a4. Knight to c4 check. King to c3. Knight to e3. Going after that pawn on g2. Rook to f8. Going after that pawn on h7. We get the pawn on g2. And he gets the pawn on h7. So white has obtained a very important strategic goal, and that is to create an outside pass rook pawn. But Mac is going to do the same thing on the other side. He wants to get that weak a pawn and have his own pass rook pawn. So play from here is pretty easy to understand. You just got to be careful of all the different little checks with the horses. And now c5 check. This is a nice move. Uh, I saw this and and. Mac played it, so that's cool. He played. If he takes here, he's going to lose his rook. Okay, that's the whole point. So king c4, which allows knight to b6 with check. And now king to d3. And now c4 check. Uh, there were other ways, but this is interesting and good. King to d4. Now c5 check. King to c3, and now he can take on a4 with check. So black has an outside pass for pawn as well. King takes c4, and now the material is completely knotted up. Knight to b6 check. King to d3, king to d5. Rook to a7 going after black's trump. And now a5, setting up a trap. It's a trap! He cannot take the pawn. He played knight to e2, but what happens if he takes? Let's take a look. Well, here, there's no fork, but there is knight c4. It threatens checkmate and hits the rook on a5. So he has to play, well, if he plays rook to b5, this is just checkmate. So he has to play rook takes, king takes, knight e4, king here. Uh, this is just a trivial win for black. Well, I shouldn't say trivial. Uh, Mac would be able to win it. He has the ability. Knight e2 was played. Rook f5, and now rook takes a5 would lose. He didn't play this. So rook f3, where does the king go? He only has one square, and this is a fork, snapping off the rook. So c4 check, avoids that. King c6, now he can grab the a pawn, but it is too late to amount to anything. Rook f3, king e4, rook h3 stops the white outside pass pawn from advancing rook a2 and knight takes c4 the easiest way to draw the game it was possible for mac to even play rook takes h2 you think oh no this is crazy you can't do that because knight to d4 check pawn takes rook takes and knight takes c4 unfortunately for black the proximity of his king to his knight means he can draw this pretty easily but if he was to do that Casiano could go on and on and on trying to win it. So that's why Mac played knight takes c4. Knight to f4. Rook to e3 check. King f5. Knight to d6. King to g4. And the players agreed to a draw at this point. So we have results on boards 1 and 4. Both games were drawn. Let's head over to Lev's game and see what kind of chaos reigns supreme over there. Okay, we rejoined this game between Altunian and Sang, where Sang had just gone off and smoked the joint and came back and sacked, it. sacked for some reason. I don't know. All right, I'm going to cut some slack because it, it is a very interesting idea. Uh, you know, we're going to go back here just to show you that, uh, you know, knight b8, knight c8 here just definitely looks like it's going to draw the game. But he played knight takes and now e3. 
and bishop to b5 locks that bishop on g2 in. But how can this really work? I mean, if you are not careful with white, you're definitely putting yourself in jeopardy. But Lev realizes, first things first, stop those pawns from coming up the board. And I have a bishop that can do that. You know, first he plays h4, king to d7, now bishop h3. And all of a sudden, there's a counter-sacrifice offer on the table here at bishop takes f5. So king to e6 had to be played. Now this presents a dilemma for black in that white can now start bringing his pieces up on the queen side and there's not much black can do about it. King to b2. Also good for Lev is that he can play almost any move he wants to play here and it's not going to jeopardize, with a few exceptions, it's not going to jeopardize him winning the game. And that means he can just keep moving around at leisure. And every time he makes a move, he gets 30 more seconds on his clock. As a matter of fact, had this game gone on longer than it did, he very likely could have ended up with more time on his clock than he started with. Uh, Bishop e2 was played, now king c3, a5. Okay, now uh, a break over here is a bit of a blink. Uh, so bishop to c7 forces a4, now king to b4 forces b5. Alright, so black is now actually in a world of hurt. It may look like he's solidified things, made it ironclad so that white can't take that pawn on b5, but Lev finds a different way around this. First thing is, is you want to create a drastic threat. And you have all the time in the world. So you want to bring your bishop back to block Black's queenside pawns from advancing. Then you're going to use your king to simply stroll on over and win the h-pawn. All right. For black to stop this, he's going to be put in sig swing with where to put his bishop. And it's not going to always be an easy choice on where to put the bishop. <laughs> and if he moves the king, we always have sack ideas on f5. So all these combined are going to give white the victory. It's just a matter of technique. All right, so bishop to b6 was played here. Bishop to d3, bishop to c5. Step one is done. Lev's position is now ironclad. Bishop e2, king to a5. Moving on to phase two, king to d7. h5, very good. Of course, you cannot take. If bishop takes, this bishop comes back into play and we'll win on b5 and then take on a4 and white is a piece up and winning very 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 easily. If g takes then bishop takes with check this is winning and if king to c6 so that he can bring the bishop back after bishop takes pawn takes h6 feeling that after g takes and pawn takes, he can go here and draw the game. But sadly, white doesn't take here. Place h6. And he can't stop the promotion. And if here, if he takes with the bishop, we don't go g7, we take here, and he can't protect the h8 square. So, easy win. So h5 is a very nice move. King has to come back to e6, and now we go h6. Remember that last position I showed you with all the arrows and the description on the back of each one, uh, where white just brings his king around to h7 to win the pawn? This is even more dangerous because the pawn's already up on h6. So, bishop c4. Black really has nothing better to do than shuffle the bishop back and forth. King to b6. Bishop e2. King to c7. Hmm. Now, let's look at some alternatives here, just to get the point across in this ending. If king to f7, then we go here. We can pick off that d pawn, so he has to protect it. Now, bishop to a3. And now, black is faced with a choice. What does he do? If he moves the bishop, to b3 or a2, we play bishop f1. If he moves the bishop to d3 or e2, we take on d5. So, king to f8. And now king to e6. 
Let's check. And now bishop to b4. Again, a dilemma for black. Where does he go? If bishop b3, bishop f1. Bishop d3, king takes d5 wins. And if he moves king to h8, well, that's even worse. King to f7, whatever. Bishop to f8, whatever. And bishop mates. Interesting stuff. Okay, so here, that was looking at king to f7. What if he tries bishop d3? Well, now we go king to d8. And he's hitting some stumbling blocks. He has to stop the king from getting in. He has absolutely no choice. King to d7, bishop e2, king to d6. And we run into exactly the same thing that we just looked at. So no matter how you... Try and massage the position for black. It always comes to the same thing. White will end up getting the king on d6, forcing you to either yield your bishop off of one of the strong diagonals, where the d5 pawn will fall, or the bishop will be let back in the game. Uh, in either case, after that, black is just totally busted. So that is why Tian decided, you know, screw it. Have to give back one of these pawns. He's actually going to have to give back both but it still doesn't work. And now he can play bishop to b5, and this stops, at least temporarily, the white king from getting into black's camp. King to b6, and now bishop e2. Bishop d3 might have been a little more solid, but it doesn't change the results any. King a5, bishop to d3, king takes a4, bishop c4, and now we still have to go back up. I guess you could go already back down. I guess we can go to a3, b2, c1, king to d1, and bishop, to, uh, and then king to e1, and bishop f1. I guess you could do that. Uh, but Lev decides to go this way and pressure him even a little more, king to b6. And he's also gaining time on the clock. That's another important feature of this. Okay, now that the concepts are all clear to you, and I'm sure the rest of this game is going to be kind of boring, so I'm going to go through it rather quickly still. Bishop d3, king to c6, bishop c4, bishop c5, bishop a6, king to b6, king a5, and now he starts coming back. He's got enough time on the clock, he hasn't fiddled around too much, and here we go. Et voila! Turns out that white was a piece up all the while. Bishop takes, king takes, and now... Yeah, this is not going to do any good. He tries, but, you know, white's got this bishop that whenever black grabs the opposition, he just moves the bishop and gets the opposition back. Easy win for white. Close, but no cigar. Black resigned at this point. All right, we only have one game going. Now Arizona leads with one win and two draws. Everything comes down to board three. And here Pedram played king f7. Worked a7 check, and it looked to me like Pedram was going to be able to draw this, which would mean it would be a victory for Arizona. Arizona would win the first match of the year for the chess league. Work to d7, d5. Things are just dead level here, but give credit to Kurt. Realizing he was in a must-win situation, he pressed as hard as he could. Work to c7, d4. Work takes c5. Now, g3 was possible, but work takes c5 d3, rook to c8, pawn takes on c2, rook takes on c2, rook to b6, forces rook to c3, rook to a6, knight to e3, rook to a2 is check, rook to c2, rook to a3, rook, to set, rook c6 check, king goes back to f7, rook to c3, rook a2, rook c2, rook a3, Rook c3, rook a2, rook c2. And everybody thought this was a draw. I asked if it was a draw in the chat room, and I think that somebody took that to mean that it was a threefold repetition. I was asking. I didn't know. Uh, but actually it's not, because in one of those positions, the king was on f6. So, yeah, it was f6. So this is not a three-time repetition. Now, if here, if he plays rook to c3, it would be. But he avoids that and plays knight to c4. You know, this is putting it all out on the limb. This is, you know, wow, you know, 
This is do or die. But then again, a draw doesn't help him any. A draw still loses the match. So he's got to try everything he can. Knight to d3, check. King to e3, and then rook takes b3. Now, this is a very important pawn for white. It looks like there's no way in hell he can win this game. King to e5, king to e6, and now knight to e3 is a mistake. And black to play and win. Yes, you heard me right. Black to play and win. Take your time to figure this out. Don't be lazy. Pause the video if you haven't figured it out. I've only given you one quiz in this entire video. Just one quiz. If you don't do this, you're missing the opportunity. Pause it and try and find a winning move for black. Okay. Well, Pedram didn't find it. He played knight to f4. This is a blunder because he could win with, you guessed it, rook to c3. What a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful move. It's the only way out of the mate threat. Now, you should first notice that the immediate mate threat is on knight c5 mate. The alternate mating threat is on f2. So if the rook takes, then knight f2 is checkmate. And if rook to a2, knight c5, okay, that's checkmate. And if knight to d1, knight c5 is still mate, nothing you can do about it. So the only way to avoid mate is to play f4 and create a fleeing square for the king. Well, now we go knight check, king drops back, and now e4 is a nice in-between move. You don't take the rook right away. We'll, we'll take it soon enough, but first you get this in because after the king moves, this is actually with check now. He has to take, and now g takes f4, and black is completely winning. He could actually offer the draw here. And Arizona could walk away with the victory for the match. So, <clears throat> Pedram. Knight f4, really. I mean, this is this is the kind of things that you see on Just.com's tactics training. You know, this is black to play and win. You know, always think that you got a move that will win the game. You know, at knight f4. Uh, he just wants to hold on to the draw. But you, you got to not look for the wins. You got to look for the wins. Rook c6 check. Fortunately for Pedram, the game is still a draw if he plays correctly. King f7, rook c2, king e6, rook c6, king f7, rook c5, king f6, rook c6 check, king f7, rook a6. Now the players have built up a little bit of time on their clock, so they're not really pushing, uh, you know, a possible loss on time. Uh, rook to b2 was played. Uh, rook to b5. Uh, this is a simple draw. I don't know why he didn't play this. It's a simple draw. <laughs> you know, is he going to bring his knight to c4 to attack the pawn and then have us play rook to b4, pinning it? I don't think so. <laughs> so this is a simple draw. Good God. Rook to b2 is still a draw, but he has to play correctly. King f5, and he's not been playing correctly so far. Now, Pedram would like to play uh, something with a sack on g2 and then push the h-pawn, but it doesn't quite work here. Um, for example, knight takes g2, doesn't quite work. Knight c4, rook here. Knight takes his check, king takes. Now, if we start pushing this over, he can check, and then comes over with the rook and stops the pawn and wins. However, e4 offers some drawing chances, and here's why. If king takes e4, rook to e2 just looks level. You know, if if king to d4 to get out of the pin, then we can check on e6. And if the king goes to d3, then we go knight f4 check. And it looks like this would draw. Another choice would be king takes g5. And now we got knight takes g2. 
And if knight takes g2, rook takes g2, pawn takes, we start pushing. And this is probably going to be a draw. And if knight c4, rook checks, king comes up, and then we go here, and black's counterplay should be good enough to draw. And lastly, if f takes e4, knight takes g2, knight takes, rook takes, rook to here, rook to e2, this is also probably going to end up being a draw with correct play. If, if you know your basic working pawn endings. So knight to g2 doesn't work here. e4 has a good chance of working. Rook to e2 was played. Still not throwing away the draw. Knight to c4, but now he throws away the draw. He does the sack on g2, which isn't the best. But Pedrin plays rook to e2. And now knight to c4. If rook takes g2 here, knight takes e5, king over, rook check. This looks like it's going to be winning for white. Yeah, he stops the pawn, and he's going to have two healthy pawns to run up the board. Um, but in this line, instead of knight to g6, if he played king takes g5, which is a very logical looking move, h3 actually should draw. But Pedram played knight takes g2. And white misses the winning move. He's played knight takes e5 here. He did not. And after king g8, rook a8 check, king g7, rook a7, king g8, now knight to g6. And it's going to be very similar to what we have in the game. But white is one move ahead on this line than what is in the game. And that's a very big move difference to have, as we shall see. So now he plays rook to a7 check, king g8, knight takes e5 h3 knight to g6 why is this different well black can now play h2 and now king to f6 should probably lead to a draw well you'd think this is winning he's threatening mate in a couple ways he's threatening rook to a8 and then rook to h8 mate and he's threatening rook to g7 mate right away so how do you stop this black to play and draw this is not the game continuation this is just something that should have happened rook to e6 check that's the move now king takes knight f4 is check and if knight takes f4 h1 is a queen and black should be able to draw this he should have every reason to believe he can hold this position. Okay. But white didn't play king to f6. He played rook to a8 check. So again, we got to ask, what difference does this make in the whole scheme of things? Now, king to f7 definitely should have been played. Because after rook to a7 check, this was not played in the game. King to e8, the king starts escaping the bonds of the mating net. And after rook a1... We've got knight blocking, okay, seven king up here, comes over this way. Then we have knight takes f3, guarding the pawn, and then we're going to play knight to h4, and then promote, uh, winning for black. So I should have tried king to f7 instead, and, and everybody was screaming for that. Head out of the mating net, head away from the mating net. Either that or play king to h7 and just end it right now. But he played king to g7. Rook a7 check, king g8. And you could try king to h6. This should still draw because after knight f8, threatens mate. But you do have knight e3 check, which forces the king away. And now knight takes g4, is check again. King f5, knight e3. King e5, knight to d5. It's discovered check. King takes, and now g4 no mating that and I think that a draw would be the right call here um, I don't see how white can win this game 
And with a draw, it would be a win for Arizona. But no, that's not the way it went. Went king to g8. And now king f6. And I think that Pedram actually pre-moved this move. He played with the e8. Can you see anything wrong with this, kids? Yeah. The move that Kurt played. Rook to g7 mate. And with that, with this stupid move, the match is tied. Arizona does not win the match, which they should have. It is tied. But you look at this and you go, but Steve, how can Black possibly get out of this mess? How's he going to handle Rook to A8 and then Rook H8 mate? Or Rook to G7 mate? You can't possibly stop both of those. All right, we'll take a moment and consider this position, please. Give it some thought. All right, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a second quiz. Well, we already showed you in a previous example. Let's work the E6 check. All right, now this is a little bit different than what it was before, because after here, now we go check. Um, promoting would be a big mistake because you can just go here, and then there's nothing that black can do other than give up his queen to delay me. But with knight f4 check, <laughs> he's got a couple choices. He can play knight takes f4 when we would promote. If he goes back here, we can play queen takes f3, and this is a draw, very simply. It's a draw. Or you can play what Greg Shahad had pointed out was queen e1 check, and this is actually going for the win. Because if he goes queen to f6, queen to e6 would be a draw. Yeah, so say you got here and go, oh, if I take it's a draw. Oh, but I can win the pawn. But you lose the game. <laughs> Pedram, Pedram, Pedram. Wow. What a shame. What a shame. And, you know, Pedram, I, I got to say it. I have to say it. You got to work on your endings. This is like the third game I've seen that because of the end game knowledge not being there, he didn't look for these things. I mean, ah, and back here, this isn't even an end game type problem. This is a middle game tactic type problem. Rook C3. How hard is that to see? Oh my God. All right. Well, folks. Thanks to Kurt's doggedness in this game, he manages to come back and win, which ties the match, which means Arizona sucks. <laughs> oh, it's an unfortunate thing. And things happen, you know, I'm, uh, it was a very tough game for Pedram. I'm not really down on you for that. It was a tough game, period. Tough from the beginning to the end. Uh, it's just too much stress, too much pressure, and he missed some good shots. All right, Arizona faces the San Francisco Mechanics um, on Wednesday, I believe it is. The 4th? Th I think it's the 4th. It's Wednesday, I believe they play. It's going to be Mac Molnar on board one versus Jesse Cry, and I believe Mac has white. So I'm going to pick Mac to win that. Board two is going to have, I think, Mohendesi. Oh, let's pull it up real quick. Yes, it's Wednesday, September 4th. Arizona will be playing, and here we go. So board one, it's Mac against Jesse, and I'm going to pick Mac on that. Board two, it's Mohandesi with Black against Daniel Naroditsky. I'm going to pick Daniel on that one. Uh, I, I'm sorry, so can, uh, it's just Daniel is turning into a monster. He's still young. He's very strong. I think he's got GM norms. I'm not positive. I believe he does. Uh, the kid's too strong, San Francisco. Come on. Send the lad off to the Bundesliga in Europe. Let him have some experience over there. Okay, on board three, we're going to have Mark Ginsburg. He should be white against Jan Liu. And I'm going to pick Mark, even though he's the underdog on rating, because I think Mark's going to come out loaded for bear. He wants to establish firmly his spot on the team. I'm, he's a very capable player, creative player. 
and I expect that his experience is going to be the undoing for Eon. Now on board four, Siddharth Vanek won, I believe, the best game from last week. It was a beautiful game. He crushed his opponent with the Black Beasts and the Sicilian. Absolutely a crush. But that was because of a couple mistakes. Brian Hugh, is pretty, uh, he's a pretty aggressive player, but he also can be very solid. So I think that even though this is Brian's first appearance in the USCL, and I think he's going to pay heed to the award that Vanek got in the last game. And he's going to be cautious, reserved, and I think he's going to be able to hold the draw. So we split on boards one and two with wins for each team. I think Mark's going to be the deciding factor with a win on board three and a draw on board four. I look Arizona to take it two and a half to one and a half. Tune in next week so you can call me a liar. All right, folks, that's it for this presentation of week one, Arizona versus Seattle. Uh, tune in next week. Check out chess.com. Watch the games live. And then you can catch my blog for the Scorpions later on. There are other teams that have blogs out there as well. Uh, you can check them all out on chess.com. And until next time, good luck.